Hi everyone, my name is Marissa and I'm in ACES. Tonight's guest speaker is Nancy McKay. <coughs> she is a JSSU instructor. She is going to be talking tonight with us about oral history. <coughs> Nancy, would you like to introduce yourself to the class and to the group? <laughs> sure. So hi everybody, this is Nancy. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here and also to see some familiar faces. So um, welcome to those who I recognize and those whom I don't. Um, I love oral history and I'm excited to um, get to uh, talk to uh, an eager group too. And uh, you probably have a lot of different interests in oral history. It may be curiosity or you may have a more serious interest too. So let's get started. <coughs> Okay, so tonight um, I'm going to be doing mo most of going to be a talking presentation too. I'm going to tell you a little bit, give you an overview of oral history. And then the second part I'm going to really uh, talk about how oral history inter intersects with libraries, which is a very uh, strong intersection too, that they are very closely related. And the, uh, the intersection really needs to be even closer to. And then finally, I'm going to end with some current issues in oral history. So I hope some of this will give you an overview or maybe inspire you towards um, opening new doors or seeking new directions in your, in your library school studies and uh, perhaps your, even your career paths. Um, I also have a handout which um, Marissa and I will work out. Uh, I would I would probably go over it at the end of the class and we'll see how that goes. You may or may not have it in your hands by that time. And it has some links to some sample interviews too. So um, you'll uh, we are going to listen to a short excerpt uh, tonight, but there's not really time to listen to full interviews, which I think is really important too. So I'll give you um, samples for, that were some of the, my favorites of my students, and uh, you'll be able to, li to continue uh, listening and viewing after um, we get offline. <coughs> okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself, just because uh, I'm a typical uh, librarian oral historian and tell you something about uh, uh, my life and uh, my, my professional life. Uh, I graduated from library school in 1983, so a fairly long time ago too, and have been working uh, actively as a librarian one way or another since then. Um, my main job was as the technical services librarian at Mills College, which is a small women's college here in the Bay Area. <laughs> And the uh, nice thing about that, or the important thing about that, is because it's small, I was able to do pretty much everything. And a lot of the times I called my own shots and organized new projects and uh, was able to do all of that and, and filled in for people when there was a vacancy and so forth too. But mainly my job was to be in charge of cataloging automation and all of the, the back of the room areas too. So one of the projects that I initiated and, and ran for a while was the oral history program at Mills College. Uh, it ran 10 years and it was just me and it was me in my spare time. So it had its ups and downs, but I really, really learned a lot. So that's my, uh, oh, and I, um, I retired from Mills a few years ago and now I just teach here at the library school uh, on my library half of my professional life. So uh, I haven't been uh, uh, working as an oral historian that long, uh, but I got into it in a kind of interesting way. I, uh, I used to be a fairly serious amateur dancer. And I, as, I, uh, as time as the years went by, you know, my body kind of started to give out. And I knew I wouldn't be doing this uh, forever. But I was looking for some way to uh, uh, continue my interest in dance, really not knowing where it was. But my, my feelers were out. You know, would it be like dance writing or dance historian, dance librarian? Um, I really didn't know, videographer. Uh, so I was looking for things, and I was walking down the street in San Francisco one day, and I saw this flyer for um, the flyer said free oral free workshop for dance oral history, and I saw the word free, and I saw the word dance, and so that's what attracted me, and I did go to the workshop. Week it's a weekend workshop, and by the first end of the first night, by the end of Friday night, I was so enthralled with the idea of oral history. I'd never ever heard of it before. Uh, the it just it spoke to me in so many ways. It had to do with 
person-to-person, uh, -person, one to one. It had to do with history. It had to do with documenting. It had to do with recording. It just, it just there's so many things about it that just grabbed me, and I thought this is the way I was going to do. And that's really what it was. It was a love at first sight with the field of oral history. And that was uh, that workshop was through the Legacy Oral History Project. It was a dance oral history project. Uh, run by Jeff Friedman from the uh, what is now the Museum of Performance, Museum of Performance and Design in San Francisco, and those oral histories are housed there. Although Jeff, the founder, has gone on to other things on the East Coast too, and I sir, it certainly launched my interest in oral history. Um, I probably pursued my interest in one way or another kind of as an amateur and often that just meant talking to people at parties about it too. And I, but I did do a few oral history projects until this opportunity at Mills College came along through a big grant. And I was uh, tagged because no one knew anything about and the whole college knew anything about oral history um, except me and my, my knowledge was very limited. But I just charged ahead and I just had a I learned so much. I had a wonderful time. So that was really the beginning of my oral history career. Um, I also teach here at the library school. I have taught um, 202, uh, LIBR 202 information retrieval um, since uh, 2008. So it's been about six years. It's been a long time, too. And I've taught oral history for about four years, too. I just really love teaching oral history, and I love teaching it to library school students. So I actually had just recently gotten an invitation to write a, a, a scholarly article on on this particular class. So uh, I, um, it's a great class, uh, 284 Oral History. I teach it fall semester. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to our hostess, to Marissa, who uh, took the class last year. And uh, it, look, Marissa, if you could say a few things about it to, uh, so people might want to get an idea of what, what it's involved. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Marissa speaking. I actually took Library 284 Oral History in the fall semester 2013. And during the time that I was taking the class, it was quite an adventure. I got to develop my own oral history project, which was comparative study of two generations, two couples immigrating from Mexicali, California, Baja California, of Mexico um, from the 1920s to 1950s, and uh, those that immigrated from the 1980s to the early 2000s. During the time that it was doing the development of it, I learned how to record uh, using an MP3. Um, how did I even did it on a wavelength? Um, just learning the ins and outs of how to do a proper interview um, <laughs> and just how to digitalize all the information that I had. It was very. It was a very good project. It was very eye-opening, and the instructor uh, McKay was very helpful, step by step and helping me catalog all the information that I needed in regards to my project. And overall, it was something that was very special to me that I got to share um, with the class and with the person that I, or with the couple that I did the interview with. So I strongly encourage all those that are interested in oral history um, just to take the class. It's, it's, it's a very rewarding um, class to take with this instructor. Thank you. It's very rewarding for me to teach, too, and my students are so inspired inspiring to me and I learn something uh, from each class, from each semester, and we get into these wonderful discussions. The class is built around an oral history project, so really all of our assignments are dealing one way or another with preparing for an oral history project, beginning with the plans uh, and deciding on an interview um, all the way down to preparing it for the archive, too. So maybe some of you have uh, are here trying to um, think about the class. And if, does, if it, does anyone here have questions about the class that you'd like to ask now? You can either raise your hand or, or chat, or type in the chat box. Nancy, we have oh. one question in the chat box. How do I see the? Is that how do I see the visual video? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, are you referring to the class, Astrid, or are you referring to uh, this this um, presentation? Oh, I see. I don't. I guess I got the wrong question. The question is a prerequisite for the class. There are no prerequisites that I know. 
of um, except for the core classes, just come in. And I certainly don't have any requ uh, prerequisites except for an, uh, a real strong interest in oral history. You don't have to have any background in either oral history or library science, too, but you do have to um, have an interest. And I think that uh, Marissa will uh, agree with me, and I know other students have, too, that you need to be willing to take some initiative too, because you have to go out there and you have to develop a relationship with a narrator, with a per or to find the person who's willing to be interviewed and develop that uh, that relationship with that person. Um, Marissa, I'm going to ask you just to take a few more minutes to talk about that. Is it's what kinds of um, uh, roadblocks or what it was like developing that relationship with the uh, a narrator as a student? You know, is 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 the, this is kind of outside the regular student project. Um, could you say something? I think the most difficult thing for me was actually getting a set in time uh, doing the interview and getting the proper equipment to do the interview um, at that time and just getting familiar with the device that I was using uh, to record the interview and then to send um, the interview as a wavelength, and then I had to convert it to MP3 at that um, when I had done the interview. Uh, but just basically getting the person to interview me was a bit difficult because there were many people that I asked, and only a few said that they would. And then I had a few last minute um, uh, volunteers that were going to be interviewed that told me no. Mm -hmm. So just fortunate enough to, to do the interview. and. Another aspect that I love about oral history is that it gives a voice to people that may not have a voice in our society that we don't necessarily document. And I think that's that's good that we get to document every everyone that we can or if there's a struggle or there's a movement going on in, in our society. That's absolutely right. And so Marissa pointed out too that it is there are two kind of big parts about this oral history, One of the, um, about this class. One of them is going out there and finding someone to interview and taking the initiative. I mean, you're really there, pretty much there on your own. And the other part is managing technology, too. So these are pretty, two pretty big ones. But I teach this class with the idea that when you get out of, out of the class, that you will be equipped to uh, conduct your own oral history project, or at least to ask the right questions. There even to be a consultant. You'll know the questions to ask, and you'll know the procedure to go forth. Um, so yeah, that. Thank you so much, Marissa. So uh, Danitza is saying, could you explain what oral history is? Uh, just stay tuned, Danitza. This is exactly what I'm going to be spending the next hour <laughs> talking about. OK, a question is, audio required? I am deaf, so I would not be able to hear. Would I be able to video record uh, instead? Um, there would, there's all kinds of special um, uh, adaptive tools, and there actually is a big oral history project, and I'll have to get your your name later too. Uh, that is it, it is associated, associated around the deaf and hard of hearing. It's it's based in Minnesota, and it's uh, one of my colleagues is there. So if you're interested in pursuing that, then I can um, I can t uh, lead you there too. So that would be a, a good resource, Danitza. Um, right, uh, uh, Marissa says oral history is a voice for people who do not have a voice in society too. So that's an, another way of using voice, and Marissa is very correct too. Um, I forgot to say how we're going to communicate too. So I, I will um, uh, be happy to accept your your questions in the chat box, and, I, and Marissa and I will both keep an eye on that, and uh, I will pause from time to time to um, ask for questions too. OK. So before we actually um, get started with the lecture, I thought um, a good way to introduce you to oral history is to listen to a short excerpt of an interview. This is an interview uh, from StoryCorps, which is a popular oral history project. Uh, uh, it has an unusual um, um, project design in some ways, but these are stories. The purpose of StoryCorps is a national initiative, and the, uh, it's sponsored in some ways by the American Memory Project at the Library of Congress. <laughs> so it is uh, kind of like the story of America. And uh, StoryCorps, StoryCorps staff go into small areas or sm uh, small parts of the country, rural areas, big cities, pretty much everywhere. Um, and um, 
um, ha uh, set up the recording booth and two people who know each other. One person will interview and one pe person will not. So that's a little bit different from the the model that we use where there's one person who is supposedly an expert in the subject will be giving all the questions. So this is more of a conversation between two people who know each other. But this is an excerpt from a Mr. Um, Clayton Sherrod from Birmingham, Alabama, who talks about being the first African American uh, chef. Nancy, I'm going to be doing the application sharing okay. right now. Is that okay with you? Sure, go right ahead. Okay, everyone. I'm going to be doing application sharing um, of this uh, presentation. Marissa, can you hear it? Hi, Marissa. I'm not sure if you're um, just having trouble or what, um, but Lisette mentioned doing a, a web web uh, based share. Um, so everyone can listen to it on their own computers. And also, Danica was wondering if the captioner will be able to um, give her captions for this video. This video. OK, so you got to see uh, Mr. Sherrod, even if you didn't hear him. So I, um, I uh, put in the link. I hope that's the right link of the um, of this uh, interview, and hope that you can listen to it regular. Although um, was it Kate who suggested something different? Okay, I um, I think probably the best thing is to move on. Wait, great. Let's. Um, uh, I couldn't hear anything either, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's great. So uh, people can listen on their own, as Lisette says. Hi, Lisette. Um, so we'll try something else. Hopefully, either maybe at the end of the class or maybe um, on our own. But let's move on right now. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, this is not <laughs> an example of, of how oral history should be shared, but we'll do. OK, so let's start with just talking about what is oral history. And oral history has so, so many de definitions. And you probably have your own definition. Most people by now have heard about oral history. Uh, it's uh, very much of a household word, word now. But I'm going to uh, mention three definitions of oral history here. Um, that kind of run through a whole spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is oral history as oral tradition. Uh, oral history is the first history. 
and for many, many millennium, our ancestors, uh, for our ancestors, oral history was the only oral. It was the only history. Um, all of our culture was passed down from one generation to another by word of mouth through stories and poems and songs uh, orally. And in many societies and in many families now, oral tradition is still, pa or history and tradition is still passed down by word of mouth. So it is very, very important um, way of transmitting culture, uh, not only in the past, but also now. And then at the other, uh, the second bullet item uh, at the other uh, extreme is what is happening today in the, uh, the community oral history, the or, in, uh, oral history as the people's oral history. Uh, oral history has really taken to the streets. And there are, uh, everyone's doing oral history. Uh, community activists are doing oral history. Churches are doing oral history. Um, performing groups are doing oral history. And they're really turning the idea of capturing voices into their own creative works, whether it be performance arts or film or to make a point or activism or human rights, whatever it is, there's just all kinds of ways that oral history is used, even, even in advertising. <coughs> um, uh, the idea of personal stories, and it's because the power, the the power of narrative, of personal story, is so, so powerful, so transformative that um, people are catching on. And this is a really, really good way to make a point, is to have do it through stories. OK, so the third bullet point is somewhere in the middle. And this is the oral history that I teach and the oral history that is generally considered part of um, the field of oral history. It's an academic discipline with specific guidelines for practice, method, ethics. <coughs> so oral histor there's something called the oral historian. Practitioners are highly trained in book learning. There's certain uh, kinds of methodology that they, they form and so forth. So it really is kind of the classic or the traditional kind of oral history. <clears throat> Not necessarily the best, but it's what, uh, because we need some kind of standards, right? Uh, this, is the con this is a set of standards, a methodology, and it is taught usually in academic uh, situations. So those are the three, um, three, three points on a very broad spectrum of what oral history is. <clears throat> Uh, this is the definition I use in my work and in my class. It's pretty simple. Oral history is a method for documenting recent history through recorded personal accounts of those who lived it. So if we want to take this apart, <coughs> um, it's oral, it's history, it has a methodology, um, it's documenting recent history. And because oral history is based on personal experience and based on memory, Oral history rarely goes, is used to document anything more than, say, at the most two generations, too. Most of the time in our interviews, we ask the person about their own experiences or their own memories, at least. And sometimes it goes back to memories of parents or grandparents or other elders, but pretty much it's kept within the, uh, the, the present time or just a short term time back. OK, what, are, what makes it oral history? These are some of the criteria that uh, distinguish oral history from other, other forms of uh, interviewing, other forms of, um, of doing research. Um, it must be in uh, interview format. That means one person is asking questions and the other person is answering. It must be recorded because the purpose of doing it is to uh, record it for posterity, for the historical record, we say. <coughs> it must have a connection to recent history. The narrator's wishes are always respected. And this is one point that is another point that really distinguishes it from other uh, fields of, um, of study, is that um, the narrator is, well, an oral history interview is usually considered a shared document too. So the narrator, uh, who is the person being interviewed, is uh, can participate in 
determining what questions will be asked, determining how deep they will go, so they can really formulate these questions before determining what is important uh, in the in the person's story, and then after the interview is con is conducted, the narrator's wishes are continued to be respected, and this means that. If the narrator said something that they regret or that they don't think should go into the historical record, then they have that option at every point along the way to um, restrain or restrict or excise uh, all or part of the interview, too. So they have a lot of control. Uh, as I said, the narrator is considered the primary author. Uh, this is different, say, as opposed to journalism or um, traditional history, where usually the historian or the journalist will be conducting interviews and but writing up, writing them up. Um, in this case, it's the narrator. <coughs> Oral history uh, is archived for long-term future use. That's one of the main reasons that we do it, is uh, for for uh, to contribute to history. And finally, it set, it follows a set of professional standards, which mean is, which basically is another way of saying it is an accepted academic discipline subject to um, uh, the rigors of ac academia. Okay. So why do we do oral history? Uh, we talked about this a little bit before. Uh, it gives voice to underrepresented groups. And those groups change with time, often because they've been uh, brought to the forefront through um, through oral history. Uh, think of certain ethnic groups, um, um, labor groups, women, LGBT, uh, who have really gone through waves of invisibility for a great deal of history. And then as time goes on, um, Oral historians, certainly not only oral historians, but they have a chance to give a voice to these these marginal groups who really have been invisible. <clears throat> uh, oral history offers another perspective to the official account of a historical event. This is off another example of uh, the management labor disputes that were go going on. Oh, se 70 or 80 years ago, more when there was the laborers had no. Um, no voice at all. It was all the management. But you know how they talk about the the conquerors write the history. Well, oral history um, tries to redress that and to offer another point by giving people um, the uh, the conquered a, a voice. Um, it documents emotions, perspectives, dreams unfulfilled, and plans not carried out. I like to think of this as what happened behind closed doors or after the door was closed. Um, so all the things that never got into um, the historical record because perhaps they were never spoken. Or all of the alternatives in terms of, uh, say, deciding legislation or deciding, coming to an agreement on something, all of the things that were cast away or can be documented through oral history. Um, it builds a collective voice for a particular time and place. <coughs> this is often um, the way that communities do oral history. Um, you know, your neighborhood, your church group, uh, maybe your cultural society uh, doesn't have any kind of earth-breaking history, but it has a very strong history as a community. and. Uh, those those uh, memories collectively can give an institutional history to a community or to a family even, uh, or just give a very uh, personal uh, picture to a particular time and place. So this is really important in community oral history. It doesn't have to be earth-shaking or dramatic, although oral history is also used to do that. And then finally, uh, oral history is used to build community. And this is because oral history is so powerful <clears throat> well, not oral history, the, the idea of personal stories, the idea of sitting down and one person talking and the other person listening is so powerful, so transformational that this is uh, acknowledged and this is used for um, marginalized groups, uh, often for to get elders and uh, young people to be able to talk to each other and other ways where there's communities are disengaged, sometimes an oral history project is just what is needed. Uh, 
Um, so, <clears throat> so that's why we do oral history and what oral history is. Now, there's also the process of oral history. And I think that oral history may, is done most successfully if it is considered as a li has a life cycle too. Uh, as you can see in this uh, in this circle, that the interview is only just one of one, two, three, four, five points uh, in the interview. The first one is <coughs> to decide on your goal up on top, because every oral history project needs some purpose uh, that determines every other step along the way. Uh, examples would be a book, uh, just community engagement to bring the community closer together. Um, uh, a theater, theatrical project or a public event or festival, or sometimes it's just done to contribute to the historical record, to put your, to do these oral histories and get them into the library so your community, a few generations down, can, can see these. So <clears throat> once you decide the goal, then uh, you develop a plan, and in our class we spend about a third of the class developing a plan, uh, planning the oral history project, uh, how we're going to approach it, the kinds of questions we're going to ask, who would be the best narrator for the particular historical question we uh, ask. There's a whole lot of things that need to go in to planning it before you even start that is, are going to really contribute to the quality of the, of the product. And if it is the interview, that's what everybody likes and uh, which really brings people together. <clears throat> but you see it's only one point. And then you'll notice the last three points on the left side of the circle, preserve, access, and use, are really the areas for the librarians and archives, archivists. So <clears throat> those of us who will approach oral history as librarians or archivists or curators, this big job for us. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause right here to see if there's any questions or comments, anything anyone would like to say, um, as I've said so far. You can either raise your hand or talk in the chat box. I'm going to, I'm going to go down and see if I missed anybody. OK. Great. <clears throat> <laughs> so, um, I'm going to use the word, when I say we're um, contributing to history, uh, wait, here's a question. Hi, Nancy. This is Kate. Um, I noticed Annika had typed a question in the chat box, and I didn't know if you wanted to address that before you moved on. Has anyone done one on the deaf community? Danica, um, it, first of all, are, is, is um, Danica getting captions right now, or will they be later? Can you answer that, Kate? Um, we have a captioner in the session, so I believe she's getting them now. Great. OK. Fantastic. I just didn't really know how that works. Um, so Danica, there, there is a little bit of oral history for, with deaf people, and it's actually very, very interesting. Um, I don't know very much about it, but one of my close friends does, and this is this project in um, in Minnesota, uh, dealing with the deaf and hard of hearing. And after the uh, after the session is over, I'd rather talk to you one on one or email with you one on one about getting in touch with that and learning more about it too, because it's a brand new idea about oral history, and that's what makes me really excited that you're here. Uh, about doing oral history too. So there are other options uh, about doing oral history visually uh, and capturing the same uh, important project of uh, stories and uh, um, narratives uh, in just a different way too. And I have to say that the deaf community is one of those areas that has been very invisible too. So this is a very this is an exciting project too. But let me talk about that after um, the um, after the session, Danica, because I don't know that much myself. I can really only can best refer you to something. Okay, anything else from anybody? <coughs> Marissa, go ahead. Um, I believe Astrid has a question um, in the chat box um, asking the one interview that needs to be connected to other interviews for a larger perception 
or a wider analysis. Otherwise, why record, why record the one that would be filed away? The one interview needs to be connected to other interviews for a larger perception of a wider analysis. Exactly. <laughs> Astrid, I didn't include that in this, uh, um, in this presentation, or at least not very much, but the value of um, the value of any piece of information is the context that it is, is presented into. And this is very important in historical record in, in oral history, particularly because we're talking about individual perspectives too. And I also have not don't have in this um, um, presentation the fact that we're not really looking for facts. We're looking for memories, perspectives, and so forth too. So this is all the more reason that we want context. Now, after one of the, the uh, areas where we're trying to connect um, uh, multiple oral histories is not only through the project, like what we do in class or an oral history project, but also through the, the metadata initiatives too. So we're trying, to, uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but one of the things that the metadata, we're working on metadata schema for oral history is to be able to connect those oral histories that may be in different parts of the world or different parts of the country or definitely not connected physically to. So that's a very good point too. And it's true of really any kind of information. Thank you for asking. OK, um, the historical record is what I call anything that sits in a repository that is well cared for that will be available to users in the future. So this is library archives. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a familiar term to you, uh, but it's basically what is, is available um, in, in public records. OK, so I want to share uh, a quote with you, which I think um, <coughs> um, which I think encapsulates what we're going to talk in the next area. Um, an interview becomes an oral history only when it has been recorded, processed in some way, and made available. Availability for general research, reinterpretation, and verification defines oral history. So um, oral historians who are not librarians uh, often uh, focus on the interview and, and then are done with it. And it, it, in some ways, it's, it's fine because the sometimes the interview, the the experience of the interview, for example, in a, in a teaching situation, is really the goal. And to be able to uh, give skills to students to engage the community with the narrator and so forth, that's important. But we're, we're not talking about that. In this class and in the library school class, we're talking about make, uh, archiving, curating these materials and putting them into the historical record, too. So that's the perspective that we use. OK, so the second section um, of this presentation is going to be about really how uh, oral history applies to libraries and archives, too. And I call this curating oral history. This is the term I will use for the rest of the, um, rather than archives and libraries, too, because Actually, oral histories exist in a great number of repositories, not only archives and libraries, but also historical societies, uh, corporate libraries, um, cultural institutions, churches, uh, and very uh, actually many, many decentralized kinds of institutions. They, there are a lot of oral histories that are in people's bedrooms, boxes, too. So we're trying to. Uh, move those into, into archives. So I'm going to use the term uh, curating, and I'm going to use the term repository instead of libraries and archives for this next section. OK, so this is um, uh, Don Ritchie. He's a well-known oral historian, and he's the author of the textbook I use doing oral history. Uh, he's the Senate librarian. I just happen to have this picture, but I uh, do want you to pay attention to, his, to this quote that, of his. The oral historians need to recognize that doing, oral, doing the interview is not the end, but the beginning of the process. And this is a way of underscoring the fact that 
we're really just creating, uh, uh, creating an oral history is like writing a book. And when the book just starts its life cycle once it's written and published, right? Same with oral history, too. We're creating an artifact that will be in the historical record that will be used for many generations to come. And that's what I really want my students to uh, think about, and really everyone to think about, too, is that the, the quality of the oral history of the interview needs to be similar to as it as though you were making a film or a book because we want it to have that same kind of access and uh, use and to be useful uh, as as much as a book or a film would be <coughs> okay so there's really basically three things that curators do um, they collect oral histories, or they collect they collect materials, and that means acquisitioning them, uh, accessioning them, bringing them into the collection, and basically it means deciding if they should come into the collection. Uh, curating, and this is all of the the areas that we commonly think of as what happens in libraries. It means taking care of the materials once they arrive. And then finally, it's sharing. So pretty much everything that curators do can be um, um, put into one of these three big categories. <coughs> OK, so we um, archivists really haven't talked that much about collecting. Um, but this is becoming more and more important. And I'm realizing it uh, as I go to some of these meetings and, and read scholarly articles and stuff like that, that this, there's a shift in the, fa in the 21st century, the fact that there is so much information, that the volume of information is so big that archivists are finally realizing that not everything can be um, collected and curated responsibly to. So we do have to make choices too. This is quite a shift from what it was even at the end of the previous century to where the idea was that every bit of information, uh, it, every kind of artifact or, or information resource was a part of our culture and needed to be sh shared. I mean, pardon me, needed to be uh, archived. And it's just becoming impossible too. So this is partly a um, a practical uh, shift in thinking, and you'll certainly find ideas on both sides, but it fits into the ideas uh, of curating oral histories, which are so time consuming and complex. Um, so we, we ask ourselves um, in terms of um, whether to accept an oral history collection or a single oral history. Does the collection fit the repository's collecting areas? And usually this has to do with subject uh, subject areas uh, or, or geographic areas too. So if you're working in a medical library, you all obviously wouldn't want to collect a, um, uh, an oral history on folk music because it probably wouldn't get very as much use as it would be in a musical library. So that's pretty obvious. And I think that's followed pretty clearly too. Is it accompanied by a proper documentation? So students in my class spend a lot of time filling out papers about the oral history. And I think because you are all library students, you know the importance of the documentation, or what we would call the, in the larger sense, metadata. <coughs> that if you don't have the accurate uh, name of the people involved, the date of the people involved, and all of the, the technical information about the recording itself, the value of the, of the document is going to be much diminished, too. So, that would be another reason for saying yes or no in deciding a, about a collection. <clears throat> uh, does the consent form meet the requirements of the repository? So we're not going to get into the idea of consent forms, which is another very complicated aspect of oral history. But oral histories do have a tradition of a, a, a number of levels of legal documents that uh, accompany them through their life cycle, too. One of them has to do with the cons uh, consent to be interviewed, for, uh, consent from the narrator to the interviewer or the oral history project. And then there is another uh, legal document that uh, transfers that uh, ownership from whoever it own, was owned by probably the oral historian to the um, their repository. And there's a, there, this is done in many different ways at many different levels of consent. But what I'm emphasizing here is 
there has to be something, and it has to meet the requirements of the repository. <laughs> it is an, uh, both unethical and illegal for uh, repositories to accept um, documents that don't meet their requirements. OK, uh, the fourth bullet item, does the repository have resources to appropriately process and store materials to? So um, anyone who's worked in archives know that the, the uh, backlogs are a fact of life. But more and more archives are starting to think about um, the fact that it really is not res uh, a responsible decision to accept an archive if they don't if they're not able to process it too. So there's, this is a hi higher level management level, but it is an important one too. And this would be another question asking uh, to be asked about that. And finally, is the repository equipped to provide physical and digital access? Because if they aren't, the ho the the materials will be will just be warehoused. They won't be available to anybody too. So all of these questions are questions that need to be asked before the archive even comes through the door. I mean before the oral history even comes through the door. So there's a, a period of negotiation between the creators of the oral history and the curators. <coughs> I hope that makes sense. So the second big area having to do with what happens to oral histories is the curating area. And this is what we um, we generally think about what archives do all the time, too. So it involves processing. Um, all of you who have been in archives, uh, you know what it is. It has to do with uh, making labels, making copies, uh, putting them in folders, uh, filling out certain documentation, and so forth. Uh, it could involve a transcription. Uh, this is another area we're not going to get into right now, but the oral histories, uh, it's generally best practices if oral histories are transcribed, though sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. And sometimes they're done before, sometimes transcripts are done before they come into the archive and sometimes they're done afterwards. Those, all, that, uh, all that is negotiable. <coughs> um, and it's also another uh, another topic for another day. Cataloging, <clears throat> likewise, another topic for another day is a very complicated um, process for oral histories, too, for a great number of reasons. And I'm going to read you from a paper um, that's on the oral history and digital age paper. These are just some of the, er the ways that an oral history might come into um, uh, arrive in an archive too. And any of you who are catalogers, you'll know that generally it's much easier to catalog something that is um, in a single format. But uh, oral histories can be a single recorded interview recorded in one session with one or more interviewees, a series of interviews recorded with the same interview participants recorded in separate sessions, and so on. They could be audio and or video recordings in one series of a magnetic tapes or open reels, digitally recorded and or video recordings in one or more audio video files, analog and digital put together, a typewritten transcript only, uh, a typewritten transcript uh, transferred to a digital file, and it goes on and on. That's about a third of the ways that were quoted as an oral history coming in. This means more to catalogers than it does to uh, those of you who aren't catalogers, too. But you'll know how complicated, uh, that's an idea of how complicated they can be. Um, <clears throat> I'm working with a, um, a number of people. I've actually, uh, there's been a lot of interest and a lot of energy in creating metadata standards and cataloging standards specifically for oral histories, just because they are so complicated. But just because they are so complicated, it's been hard to get this off the ground and to come to any kind of agreement. But this um, initiative for metadata for oral histories has been going on for about 10 years. And uh, we're making a little bit of progress. <clears throat> and then finally, in the curating phase, um, is everything having to do with technology. There's a lot of complications. Uh, is it audio or video? And each uh, of these areas is handled differently in the archive. Is it analog or is it digital? And if it's analog, are you going to digitize it? More decisions, more complications, more expense, and more labor. And then there's, of course, the, 
the issues of long-term and short-term, but especially long-term digital management too in an archive too. So the archives have to be prepared and equipped, or they should be prepared and equipped to be to handle all of these areas of curating too. So you can see it is a very complicated um, process too, and hopefully it might be a good um, uh, path for uh, future people looking for a career. <clears throat> <laughs> and the final function of archives is sharing. Now this is another area that has been shifting in the 21st century where archivists and curators are becoming a lot more proactive in making uh, their materials accessible. And this is so wonderful. When I started in library schools, uh, I mean, in, li in working in libraries, they always said that there was a shift because the thing about libraries is that they like to, uh, they don't do a very good job of um, uh, uh, preserving their materials because they're published and they can just order new ones. But they really good job at, uh, do a really good job at sharing and that uh, archives are just the opposite, that they, they are very meticulous about all of their unique uh, materials, their, their unique collections, and taking really, really good care of it, but they really don't like anybody to, uh, to look at that stuff without um, hand uh, gloves and uh, signing your name off and all this kind of stuff. Too. Well, that's, that's changing, too, and that also is <clears throat> partly because of the digital world too. So uh, archivists are a lot more pro, uh, proactive in providing access and that's in different ways. Um, outreach, uh, Facebook, uh, doing exhibits, um, brochures and so forth. Uh, rights management has to do with the uh, intellectual property issues of sharing and putting your, your um, uh, materials out to the public. Uh, this is a huge area that is subject to a lot of ongoing debate and a lot of it is centered around the idea of oral his of the internet basically and um, I, the center to the debate is is there a difference between making oral his making materials available in a physical archive where the researcher needs to make an appointment physically come to the archive, have a relationship with the archivist, uh, look, them in, look that person in the eye and the, and the archivist will hand the, the materials to that person and they have full access to it. Is there something about that relationship that is different from uh, putting it, the whole oral history on the, on the internet <coughs> and having anyone having it come up through God knows where on a, on a Google search and the archivist will have no idea how that's being used, if it is. Uh, these are big questions, and it, they will be worked out over a number of decades, too, but very interesting, too. Uh, there are um, other issues with rights management has to do with privacy and really protection of the narrator, too. So as the, the, there's such a wide net that is cast by the internet. So um, another area that we've sometimes forget about in terms of sharing is physical access within the institution. And this means is there a, a pleasant reading room, a viewing room, and does the, uh, does the reading room have um, <clears throat> uh, proper playback and, read, uh, and listening and viewing equipment too. So um, it's really easy uh, for us in an online uh, graduate uh, program to think that there's some people who don't use the internet all the time every day and there's some people who don't use it ever, and they will travel a long ways to go to uh, physical access within an institution too. And that's not going to change. There will always be groups of people who prefer it, <coughs> the physical world. Uh, maybe some of them are among us. Um, okay, so, and then the, finally, uh, it has to do with everything about digital digitization and the internet. Um, that is a class in itself. Um, we could talk about all kinds of issues too, but there are many big issues having to do with oral histories on the internet, and those conversations are ongoing. Okay, and let me pause just a second to see if there's any um, interviews. We're, we're coming towards the end. Okay.
So there's, as I mentioned, there's just so many big issues in talking about oral histories in libraries. <clears throat> these are the ones that, um, these are just four that I think are, are pretty big uh, that you might want to pursue. Um, the one is backlogs and orphans. If you work in an, ar an archive, you know that backlogs are a fact of life. But archives, responsible archives, are really making a big effort to diminish the the backlogs, as I mentioned. Orphans are refer to um, information resources that, for one reason or another, can't be made available to the public. So they're just sitting there in the archive. And it's a, a really unfortunate kind of uh, situation, too, because they're taking up space. Some of them are very valuable to the historical record. <coughs> the two reasons that are most common in the oral history world for uh, materials to be orphaned is number one that they don't have a consent form, um, and number two, if they the recording is on either uh, media uh, media that has deteriorated. Uh, this is most common in audio cassettes. The uh, magnetic tape is deteriorating, or if the uh, um, repository doesn't have proper playback uh, machines, too. So uh, little by little, <coughs> these uh, orphans are, are every, every uh, archive feels terrible about having these, or, these uh, materials that can't be used. And they're you know kind of um, hitting away at reducing the orphans um, as, as it goes on. But they're all always very complicated. So that's one big issue. The other big issue is metadata. And uh, as I said, we've been working on it for a long time. And um, the oral history community is. And um, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while. But when I talk about metadata, I mean not just the cataloging data, which is also very important, but the full range of metadata having to do, a lot of it is computer generated. And as we move into a digital environment, that is going to get more and more important as we move, because we're looking for the long-term uh, <coughs> preservation, right, too. So we want to make sure that all of the, all, all the instances of the digital object, uh, the formats, the refreshment, and so forth is properly cared for. Rights management, I talked about before. And oral histories on the internet, I also mentioned before. See, I have a question in this chat box. Um, Sylvia says, uh, I like the point you made about the amount of oral history that exists in corporations. I hadn't thought about corporate libraries that way before. Yeah, I, I, I don't think many people do. <laughs> I um, conducted a survey on oral histories and repositories uh, um, last year to revise my book. And I got um, out of 300, I think I got 20, about, about 20 from corporate archives, too. So it is really very interesting. And who knows, it may be a job possibility. OK, um, so what can libraries do? <clears throat> These are some, in addition to um, collecting oral histories and saying yes when their uh, donations are offered. Um, Oral histories can actually, uh, or libraries can actually uh, actively collect oral histories. And that means conducting oral history projects within the library, too. And this is a really common thing, especially in um, um, public libraries, too, because pu uh, public libraries have this community base and often a lo local history collection, or they want to collect local history, and they have a, often a good volunteer base. So it's a very uh, logical thing to do is to have an oral history project. Um, so conduct an oral history project. Uh, oral uh, libraries can provide training in interviewing for family or local history. Uh, these are very popular training programs. Um, another one that people don't often think about is to build oral history into collection development. And uh, if you're in charge of collection development, just check as you you know you go through catalogs or choice cards or whatever you do, and see if oral history is mentioned as part of the book. And um, if so, maybe have a, a tag or a, just add a subject heading. I mean, it's as simple as that. Go through your existing heading, uh, your existing collection, and add the subject heading oral history into um, materials, uh, not just books, but also videos and audios <coughs> for collection development. 
And then finally, partner with community groups. So um, oral history, uh, I mean, libraries uh, and community groups make wonderful partnerships because the communities have that community base and the trust and the know-how, and libraries have all of the in infrastructure uh, resources and institutional resources, too. So that pretty much winds up um, what I have to say. And um, I want to, oh, it's actually, it's exactly 7 o'clock. So I want to thank you all. And I want to make sure, Marissa, that we're, you're going to give the handout um, uh, to, the, to the students. Uh, is it now or later? I am working on it. Uh, I will be in about a minute or less than a minute. That's fantastic. So um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Any questions? Okay. Who funds oral history projects? Uh, Lisa is asking. Generally, um, there are some large funders. Uh, the Library of Congress, IMLS, does some oral history projects. Uh, California Humanities Council, and actually other state humanities council also does that. Um, and there's also private funding. But getting funding for oral history projects is it always um, a task. Now, I, in my more recent work, I've realized that there are a lot of ways to, um, oh, I got some applause. I think that's so cool. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Uh, that there are a lot of ways to substitute um, uh, money for hard work. And uh, if, uh, if you're willing to um, contribute labor and, uh, and so forth, there's a lot of ways to avoid that, too. Um, okay, so um, this week, this um, this handout includes the one, two, three, four, five sections, and let me just tell you <coughs> a little bit about it too. Uh, under organizations, I want to mention the Center for Digital Storytelling, Groundswell, and Voice of Witness are all San Francisco-based uh, organizations or have a a, pl a place in Sa in the Bay Area, and they are contributed or they're um, Dedicated to uh, social act, social justice, and community activism in one way or another. So those are very uh, dedicated, wonderful organizations. Uh, you can check out those. Do they have all have training sessions? There's a one in the country. There's one master's degree program in oral history. That's at Columbia University. It's about um, only about five years old, but it's really gotten some uh, great re reviews. Uh, oral History Association and Society of Archivists Oral History Section are the two really main um, professional organizations. And if you're already, uh, if you already belong to the Society of American Archivists and you're interested, do check out the Oral History Section. Um, the link is on here on this uh, sheet, and it will be able to. Um, um, I, you'll just find out there. I think they have a newsletter, and they're getting more and more active. OK, uh, did I get a question? Hi, this is just to let everybody know that ACES has the survey posted on our chat box. If anybody would like to go ahead and just click on the link in order to give us your feedback on tonight's presentation if you have not done so. Thank you. Thanks, Marissa. Okay, so um, oh, there it is. Yeah, let's get out of here. Um, the online resources I have a couple of um, listservs, uh, online discussion groups, which are very useful, and then at the on the on page two are a list of uh, featured interviews too. So I hope that that is going to be useful for you, and I welcome you to sign up for the class next fall, and I hope you had a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, for being our presenter tonight. And thank you, Marissa, for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Just to let everybody know, um, a recording link to um, the session tonight will be posted. Um, so please look, please look out for that. and. Um, Thank you, everybody, for attending tonight's session with 
Instructor Nancy McKay. Um, Marissa, thank you. Um, and if anyone from my 202 class is still here, just know that I will post that the link on that class in the um, uh, libraries in the in library in the world, and also on the uh, front page. Uh, so I'll post that link. And uh, Marissa, I wondered if you will, will you be able to post the, the PowerPoint so slides too? Um, they the everything should be accessible. On our on our website, we also have one on YouTube uh, for everybody. And if anyone has any questions that would like to receive um, slides of tonight's presentation, just let me know. I'll post my email in the chat box. Great, thank you. And if anybody wants to contact me too, I'm always happy to hear from you. Okay, I'm going to sign off. And thanks for coming.